Hello, welcome back to the show, everybody. Today we have on a very special guest. His name is Kevin Carson. He uh, is a senior fellow at the Center for a Stateless Society and holds the center's Carl Hess Chair in Social Theory. Formerly a mutualist individualist anarchist, he now identifies as an anarchist without adjectives. In addition to the classical individualists, he is influenced heavily by theorists of post-capitalism and commons-based peer production, Eleanor Ostrom's natural resource governance theory, and autonomous Marxism. Uh, His written works include studies in mutualist political economy, organization theory, a libertarian perspective, the homebrew industrial revolution, a low overhead manifesto, and the desktop regulatory state, all of which are freely available to read on the website that I have pulled up on the screen. Uh, He's also written for such publications as The Freeman, Ideas on Liberty, and a variety of internet-based journals and blogs, including Just Things, The Art of the Possible, The P2P Foundation, and his own mutualist blog. Uh, So, Kevin, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. So uh, the website doesn't mention this book, um, but you recently put out a book called The State, Theory and Praxis, and I think it's an incredibly topical book and wanted to talk with you about that today. How does that sound? Cool. All right. So um, I like to read just about anything that comes out that I could get my hands on when it comes to the state. So Peter Gelderloos put out a book um, called Worshipping Power. Not, I guess it's probably been like 10 years already. Um, Then uh, not that long ago, there was a book called uh, The Operating System that uh, was pretty good. And now you are, you have released this book and is it available online or is this uh, text only? Um, it's, uh, so far just text only, but I'll probably be uploading a PDF of it, uh, before long on my academia.edu page or someplace. I, uh, probably won't be, uh, on kevinacarson.org for a while because a friend of mine built the website for for me and i have to ask her to edit it yeah that makes sense um but you do have your other other books on there exodus which i believe is the most recent one before this the desktop regulatory state the homebrew industrial revolution organization theory studies in mutualist political economy Mm -hmm. uh before we get into your most recent book uh i i we come from somewhat separate anarchist circles and um there's not a lot of uh understanding from my circle which would be like the nihilist egoist Mm -hmm. types uh when it comes for to c4ss and uh I kind of just wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. You say on your website that you were formerly a mutualist individualist, but now you identify as an anarchist without adjectives. What, what changed there? Well, uh, in my individualist phase, my, uh, which lasted quite a while, more than a decade, I guess, after I became an anarchist, uh, My primary influence was uh, Benjamin Tucker and uh, similar thinkers like Thomas Hodgkin uh, and people in the the Boston Anarchist Group. Uh, The goal I was seeking was a kind of free market anarchism uh, or free market anti-capitalism where uh, completely a market completely freed of state enforced artificial property rights and state enforced artificial scarcities like um, absentee landlordism 
intellectual property, credit monopolies, and so forth, would uh, result in labor receiving its its full product and all all forms of economic rent and uh, surplus labor extraction being eliminated. I also used the the phrase left-wing market anarchist at the time. I guess what changed was that I became more and more dissatisfied with the term market. Uh, The more I read about, the more I read of history. Uh, And I was always skeptical to a pretty great extent about schematic visions of uh, future society organized around some single ideological organizing principle like markets or communes or syndicates or or, or whatever, because I just don't see a uh, transition plausibly happening that way, you know, by converting everyone to some hyphenated anarchist ism and getting on the same page is something that's a lot more likely to occur with all sorts of different tendencies, uh, local experimentation in various economic forms and so forth, emerging from the ruins of capitalism and coalescing into a new system on a very ad hoc basis. And I, aside from just the, uh, the, my you know problems with reorganizing society around some single monolithic template. I had problems with the term anarchist itself because I'm, I mean with the term uh, market itself or free market because you know like it or not the term market carries a lot of baggage associated with the cash uh, cash nexus and with, you know, market uh, in the sense of an institution where goods are exchanged. And I, the more, you know, the more I got into reading uh, the history of capitalism, the more skeptical I became of the very idea of a society organized around the, the cash nexus, just because the origin of a cash nexus economy involves such a huge amount of state force in creating it. And I don't think you can separate the idea of a, a market as like the central organizing uh, model for a society from the history of capitalism and the role of the state in establishing market-centered economies. I don't, you know, I don't rule out um, the idea of markets, I think they're likely to be part of the mix in, in most places, but I just don't like, uh, like it becoming the uh, hegemonic principle of an entire society. How much did watching what's happened with cryptocurrencies impact that, um, uh, that transition for you? probably not a whole lot i mean there was a time when i was a lot more sympathetic to crypto and to bitcoin in particular uh like you know 10 10 years ago before it became clear what characteristics bitcoin actually had uh I, I, in general, I like I like the idea of uh, alternative currencies and uh, the idea of encrypting them. But the specific model that's associated with the term cryptocurrency, you know, especially Bitcoin, is uh, something that's you know primarily an artificially scarce investment asset rather than an actual medium of exchange. Right. I'd, I'd much prefer to see an abundance based currency model that is purely a, a unit of ac- account 
or exchange rather than an investment asset like Thomas Greco's credit clearing system. You know, if, if someone came up with uh, an encrypted version of that, it would be great and it would be a lot better in terms like, you know, energy use and environmental concerns because the whole rationale for proof of work would no longer exist. There'd be no mining of the units of currency or anything like that because it would be a purely, a purely an accounting unit. Yeah, uh, and that's a huge concern, uh, the environmental impact of mining and everything, the energy consumption. Um, so uh, that said, um, one of the... The, I read somewhere that you still think very highly of your book, The Home Homebrew Industrial Revolution, especially the two chap first two chapters. Yeah, the and, first two chapters, definitely. Uh, so I want to start there just to build a little bit of um, uh, groundwork uh, for where you're coming from and your view of how, really how, society's function um so one of the one of the conceptual tools you use is this distinction between the eo technic the uh what is it the anthro the paleo technic the paleo technic and the neo technic yeah and um can you just rehearse that framework for us a little bit so that we we have that uh understanding it's a it's a framework that originally uh came from lewis mumford in his book techniques and history um eotechnic was the term he used for the the uh technolo technological evolutions in the late middle ages uh in the free towns and, and uh, so forth. It was largely liberatory and decentralized, uh, heavily relied on things like clockwork and water and wind power. And just with water and wind as prime movers, there was already a lot of exper experimentation with uh, using them to drive all kinds of different clockwork applications for for transmitting power to machines of one kind or another. And you can see some early grasping by people like uh, Da Vinci at uh, coming up with all kinds of interesting mechanical devices uh, that could have been powered by those prime movers and, and clockwork power transmission. So uh, all, all the stuff that happened later in the uh, in what's conventionally referred to as the Industrial Revolution are, are things that would have probably been entirely feasible uh, based on the eotechnic uh, technology tree. The paleotechnic is, you know, it, it roughly overlaps with what's called the first industrial revolution starting in the 17th century, uh, associated, you know, primarily with industries like coal mining, uh, minting, uh, forestry, armaments and so forth that were all caught up uh, in an in institutional complex of uh, the alliance between the new absolute states and military industry and extractive industries and so forth. Uh, it eventually gave birth to coal power and the steam engine. Uh, uh, steel is the primary uh, manufacturing material, uh, 
and the so-called dark satanic mills were an outgrowth of that, the, for the early factory system. And it tended to be centralized and authoritarian. Uh, it's, it's what we generally associate with the most negative aspects of early capitalism. Neotechnic was what Mumford referred to as the, as, uh, it's the term Mumford used to refer to uh, what's conventionally called the second industrial revolution in the late 19th century. The biggest single innovation of the second industrial revolution was the applications of uh, findings of Maxwell and Faraday to electrical power generation and the development of electrically powered machinery. Also to a lesser extent, the, the chemical industry and the internal combustion engine and the general tendencies of this uh, neotechnic phase were much more liberatory and decentralized. You can see the same themes being developed, not only by Mumford, but by Kropotkin, uh, Ralph Borsodi, and a lot of other, other thinkers, even uh, at least, you know, uh, in passing by fiction writers like William Morris in News From Nowhere. And as Mumford and Borsodi and, and the others wrote about wrote about the neotechnic revolution electrical power was ideally suited to a decentralized small shop model of production something like the modern industrial networked production or industrial district system in Emilia Romagna in, in Italy where uh, in, where the primary tools of production are general, you know, small scale general purpose tools that enable quick shifts of production between different product runs. So you don't have a large amount of overhead and you don't have specialized uh, single purpose machinery. Uh, there requires expensive retooling and so forth. And there's, there's no imperative to prevent idle capacity. You just uh, operate on a lean basis or a demand pull basis where you just switch from one production run to another as the orders come in and you shut down when there aren't any orders and you don't have the high overhead costs from fixed capital outlays that you would have in mass production. But instead that electrical power wound up being integrated into the 20th century mass production system, which is extremely uh, capital intensive, extremely high overhead and relies on expensive product specific machinery uh, and expensive dyes that need to be fully utilized and worn out in order to pay for themselves. So with mass production industry, you have to undertake production with some, at least some idea of a guaranteed market for whatever you're producing in order to count on being able to amortize or pay back the capital outlays. So you have to, it, in the end, it uh, requires a large scale centralized industry uh, and it requires building the entire society around guaranteeing consumption of the output and uh, utilizing full capacity so there won't be losses from idle capacity. Right. And then there's a financial component to that as well, because there's so much startup capital required to even begin with that model of production, right? Yeah. And uh, the more uh, severe the crises of idle capacity and underconsumption 
become uh, the more idle uh, investment capital is sitting around without any profitable outlet, which means you wind up with the kind of growing bubble economies or fire economy that we've had since the 1970s. Uh, the industrial capitalism was dying uh, in the Great Depression as a result of all of those tendencies towards idle production capacity and underconsumption. And what saved it was World War II, uh, first with uh, military production, putting all that idle capacity to work in the United States, and second with uh, the war itself blowing up half of the mass production industrial capacity in the world so that the United States emerged from the war with a, a global market that was able to fully absorb its entire output and with a large amount of output required just for rebuilding all the damage. But by about 1970, all of that wartime destruction had finally been rebuilt and East Asia and Western Europe were both uh, major industrial powers again, which meant that that 25 year reset came to an end and we were back to the same problems we had in the 1930s, uh, excessive production capacity without a, enough demand to keep it in use and a lot of idle capital and from that point on, it's just been one expedient after another to create artificial outlets for that surplus capital. So there's, I actually have like three, three questions immediately that come from everything you just said. Um, well, one, one's more of a statement. So one of the things that makes your arguments here really important is that uh, there's on the authoritarian section of the political compass, one of the big uh, arguments that they like to make is that authoritarianism is necessary because of the complexity of managing this sort of um, centralized uh, mass production model economy, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, it's just about every like debate I have with someone who's authoritarian, it'll eventually get to this point to where it really comes down to analyzing what the capacities of our technologies are and what sort of administrative regime uh, is necessary to keep the thing going. So it's incredibly relevant that you you choose this topic to write on. So that's the one that's more of a statement. Um, my first question is, do you think there's a fourth uh, period that Mumford did not talk about that we're currently in? And then the other question is, um, has more to do with the way that this relates to military expenditure and the, and the way our, an advanced military functions. But uh, if you could take those one at a time, uh, as far as the current period, whether it's a, a new productive period or not, and then the second one about the military. I guess uh, you could refer to the period we're in now as a fourth period. I, th I think of it as just the productivity of neotechnic technology becoming so great that it's no longer possible to incorporate it into the mass production framework. Uh, it's a case where the new wine was put into old bottles, uh, old paleotechnic bottles for a hundred years and it's finally bursting them open. Uh, 
it's the same general uh, neotechnic principle that uh, Kropotkin and Mumford and Borsodi wrote about. Only it's greatly, it's been greatly intensified since the 1970s by the integration of, of cybernetic technology into those craft tools. Uh, we, you know, first of all, with the uh, industrial district production model in Italy uh, and with the job shops in Shenzhen and in China and, and so forth. And then with the rise of desktop manufacturing from the late 90s or early in this century on that took the costs another order of magnitude even lower than that. Uh, it's, it's got to the point where uh, the implosion of, of required cost outlays for industrial production has taken up the, the crisis of surplus capital several notches. Uh, trying to think, I uh, can't remember the name of the, the writer. I, I quote him in uh, Homebrew Industrial Revolution, but he, he talks about the uh, tech economy terminating uh, uh, the capitalist economy because when it, it requires, you know, a tenth as much capital to engage in the same kind of output, suddenly you have all this extra investment capital just sitting on the shelf with no profitable outlet to a much greater extent than you you had even, you know, formerly in, in mass production capital capitalism. And, you know, I think we've reached the point where uh, the old corporate walls and the uh, intellectual property based barriers that they rely on are no longer strong enough to contain the productive potential of this technology. I think as capitalism decays, we're going to see the emergence of a genuine successor economy based on town and neighborhood workshops and home-based industry and uh, an entire counter economy uh, based on the social and household sector or cooperative production for the market uh, of the kind that Borsodi envisioned a uh, hundred years ago. As, as for military industry, uh, just a, I don't have any general comment but just a, a couple of a uh, couple of points uh, first of all it's interesting how much uh, military r and d amounted to the capitalists providing the rope to hang themselves with because all of the cnc technology that's currently used in the emilia romagna workshop model and in desktop production tools was originally developed uh, by Pentagon sponsored research and it was first put to use in production the mass production industry uh, by military contractors producing for the Air Force uh, the, those giant GE plants with the, the giant uh, drill presses and lathes and and so forth powered uh, controlled by uh, computer and numeric technology. And as com but as computers became miniaturized and, and the miniaturization of electronics was itself an offshoot of, of Pentagon research, uh, the computers, the uh, computer controlled tools could become smaller and smaller and progressively cheaper until it undermined the, the technical basis of mass production industry. So the uh, small scale desktop tools we've got today are the uh, direct self-destructive 
result of Pentagon policies 70 years ago. Uh, the second point is that with uh, the ephemeralization and cheapening of technology, I think we're seeing uh, a shift to the advantage of the t- defensive with uh, assassins, mace weapons, and uh, area, area denial weaponry that's making it a lot more expensive and a lot less feasible for big military powers to invade small ones. You know, we're seeing this to some extent with drones in Ukraine making the old uh, armored vehicles pretty much obsolete. And, you know, it's uh, been a major concern of the Pentagon, uh, area denial weaponry uh, threatening their power to project, uh, um, threatening their ability to uh, project power in the Persian Gulf or in uh, the South China Sea. And I think that will that will continue uh, until the advantage of the the defensive side with small, cheap, uh, high tech weapons will be so great that the old military dinosaurs and superpowers will just be destroyed like a, a by a swarm of piranha when they try to attack small powers. That I that's a uh, couple of good points there. <laughs> um, so the takeaway from homebrew industrial revolution, which you touched on, but I wanted to make explicit is that there's a decentralization of the production process or production processes that not only are possible, but are already happening. Right. Yeah. And, um, so I wanted to really nail that down because um, when we start talking about your your new book, The State, there, you know, uh, well, let's just get into that. So you begin The State by talking about what the origins are for states. And you go through this really um, uh, uh, deep and... Um, from what I could tell, very well researched uh, study of this. Uh, although then you put it to the side, but I still think it's uh, extremely relevant, um, and especially when we start thinking about it uh, in relationship to how centralized economics and production are. So, to begin with, uh, you know. What so there's you know a, a handful of theories about how the state begins in human history, and there's uh, the main theory, which is that it's like this social contract that just everybody got together and decided they would sacrifice some of their freedom for the mutual protection of all, and blah blah blah, right? Yeah. Uh, and then there's. Um, theories about agriculture, which you see people like John Zerzan or uh, other eco-anarchists will um, associate authoritarianism and the state with agriculture itself. Um, But what you do is you, um, you found out through your research that neither of these are really accurate pictures of how the state formed. And um, you start talking about how it's not just agriculture, but a specific kind of agriculture, alluvial agriculture, and not only that, but also some geographic elements. And if you want to elaborate on that for us just a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, well, these are are all things I got from the works of uh, either Michael Mann or David Graeber or... James Scott, uh, who all tended, 
overlap considerably and dovetail uh, produce similar similar analysis. But the idea is that uh, you know it is an agriculture as such. It's uh, particular legible kinds of agriculture that are easy to exert state power over uh, like you know seasonal c- cereal crops that are highly visible and harvested within a very short time window so that they're easy for states to confiscate at fairly low cost other kinds of agriculture uh, like you know Uh, Root crops uh, are a lot less legible to states and less easy to confiscate. And historically, uh, where people practiced cereal agriculture, they didn't uh, practice uh, a monoculture system. It was generally just one part of a much larger basket of alternative food sources that included hunting and and foraging and uh, growing root crops. Uh, Cereal agriculture only led to the rise of the state when something happened to prevent people from being able to back out of the cage and abandon cereal agriculture for something else, you know, something like uh, a climate shift. Uh, A lot of the areas where the first city states emerged with uh, alluvial agriculture were areas that previously, um, before the climate shifted, had been, uh, you know, full of, of wetlands, wide diversity of wild crops suited for foraging and so forth. And it was only uh, with uh, the end of the ice age and the drying up of the, the climate uh, that the, the wetlands and the wild crops started dying off and the Cereal agriculture uh, dependent on irrigation water became the primary source of food. And once that happened, it was a lot harder for people to shift to other sources of livelihood when some one would be uh, state formation started harassing them for tribute. People, uh, as Graber wrote, uh, People would sometimes experiment with state-like formations at certain periods of of the year, but still, you know, their power was limited because of people's uh, ability to withdraw from them at will if they became too oppressive. And when the climate changed and uh, formerly ecologically diverse areas became suitable only for cereal crops, people lost the ability to get out of the cage. And that's when the states enclosed them in those limited areas. And since then, the state has expanded uh, from those areas. So I, so, um, that's excellent. Um, and just to really harp on this for a minute, there's a tendency to naturalize the state and uh, all of the recent research, Graber, maybe not all of it. I don't even know what all of it would be, but um, you know, in anthropology, this is proven, I think fairly well that the state is not really uh, a natural, like inevitable outcome of human social life. Right. Right that these circumstances were fairly rare and um, when they did occur uh, that's 
sort of the the origin of what we now have in state-based societies yeah it's actually the states actually arose uh just as a result of uh you know the equivalent of, of winning a lottery where a number of unlikely or atypical conditions all came together at just the right time uh you can see that through, uh, throughout, you know, most areas where agriculture was practiced, uh, states did not come into existence as long as uh, it was a temperate climate and, and uh, cereal crops could be uh, irrigated by rainwater. It was only in a handful of allu- alluvial uh, areas like uh Mesopotamia, the Nile, the Indus, and the upper uh, Huang He River that uh, that it first came into existence. And there were large strips of agricultural territories uh, through most of the, the Fertile Crescent that didn't uh, have city-states until uh, the political power ex- expanded from lower Mesopotamia. And even even then, uh, you know, for most of human history, just up until the last millennia, a millennium or two, uh, areas subject to state authority were a pretty small uh, portion of the total inhabited globe. Right. And, and even, and we didn't even really have borders in a sense, uh, for a long time, even after states formed, just because there wasn't that sort of, uh, military power to regulate them. And there were, there was enough, uh, hinterland on, uh, the outside of, uh, state controlled areas that it uh, took quite a while for just enough territory to be aggrandized for one state to run up against the territory of another. Exactly. So now all of this knowledge is great. And uh, in your book, I understand why you, you spell that all out and then you set it aside because the questions that we ask ourselves on the left, socialists, whatever you want to call ourselves, are, first of all, what even is the state? Second of all, uh, is it merely an instrument of a ruling class? Uh, and is it um, is that necessarily a capitalist ruling class? And then... Uh, finally, what we uh, non-capitalists can do about it, right? So there's about five authors that you quote extensively throughout this uh, uh, first half of the text, I would say. And uh, you use them to explain what the different theories are about the state in general and uh if you could give just a little summary for uh the four or five different competing theories about the state i think we could move on to to the more practical questions after that oh yeah i mean the the most widely accepted theory and i think uh probably the most the least the valid one is the one that uh, that, that most uh, intro to political science uh, instructors would probably pass on to their their students in colleges. The the interest group pluralism theory, uh, which you know, I don't think it, it's even worth looking into except to debunk. Um, 
There's the uh, Marxist theory that the state is the instrument of a an extractive ruling class. Um, and I think closely related to that would be the old left or corporate liberal analysis of American history that argues even uh, the progressive policies associated with the New Deal and great society reflected the interests of one particular faction of capital. Uh, in, in the case of uh, corporate liberalism, it was in large response, uh, uh, in large uh, well, it was largely a response to uh, the historiography of people like Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who said that the Republican Party was uniquely uh, the party of big business interests and that uh, the Democratic Party represented the little guy and organized labor and, and uh, so on. And their uh, main main drift of their uh, policy was to keep big business from getting its way. Uh, corporate liberal thinkers and power elite thinkers like Mills and Domhoff argued that actually both major political parties represented two different factions of capital. Uh, the Republican Party represented the old National Association of Manufacturers coalition of uh, industry that was comparatively labor intensive and produced from for the local uh, for the domestic market and was dependent on tariffs uh, whereas uh, the new deal coalition represented capital intensive export oriented industry and it was it was uh, this industry, this kind of industry associated with the New Deal coalition was disproportionately mass production industry that uh, had extremely high capital outlays and overhead and long time horizons for production so that they had to be able to count on guaranteed demand for their product. And they had to be able to make long-term plans when it came to planning the production process. But on the other hand, because they were capital intensive, labor compensation was a smaller part of their total cost package. So it was in, in their interest to cut a deal with organized labor uh, where they would give higher wages and benefits in return for stability and predictability in the workplace. Uh, and the main terms of the deal were, uh, we'll give you, you know, seniority based layoffs. We'll give you a grievance procedure. We'll give you these benefits and wages geared to productivity increases. But in return for this, the uh, bureaucratic union leadership will enforce the terms of contracts against their own rank and file and uh, prevent things like wildcat strikes and direct uh, action on the job. And they will enforce management's right to manage within the workplace and limit labor disputes to things like work hours and pay and not the production process itself. So, uh, one of the, one of the other big issues that you, spend quite a bit of time writing about is the question of how autonomous the state is from the, the economy in general, uh, or in other words, from capital or from particular capitalists. So the reason that the importance that I seeing that question is when it comes to debating uh, Marxists 
And, you know, uh, this whole idea that if you can uh, capture the state, you'll be able to create a classless society through its institutions because there's nothing inherent to the state or the estate isn't really autonomous. It's um, more or less just a uh, a vehicle that any passenger can hop in and control. Yeah, I, I didn't get into a couple of other schools. Uh, the uh, instrumental, uh, the, um, can't even, uh, the uh, structuralist, uh, theory of Nikos Palazzis and uh, the state autonomous theory of Theta Skokwal that both saw the state to different degrees as being more autonomous from the ruling class than uh, Marx or the power elite theorists considered it. But uh, I would say it, it's... Uh, it's it's uh, because of the nature of the state itself and just the structure of a state apparatus that it's impossible for a state to ever represent uh, a majority of the general population or represent uh, the producing majority in, in their interests. Uh, just given its its very structure and the fact that the state apparatus itself is made up of a relatively tiny fraction of the population engaged in the day-to-day -day policy process, they're going to have an inside advantage in access to information uh, an advantage in energy and attention and just uh, in terms of available time compared to those outside the state. So they're always going to be at the, uh, they're going to put the majority of the population at a disadvantage when it comes to just things, you know, like setting the basis, basic agenda and what the terms for, debate are. Uh, I think even when a genuinely uh, working class mass movement managed to manages to get its representatives into the state, uh, that its people in this uh, controlling the state apparatus will become, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not wedded to the term ruling class, but they will at least become a ruling stratum with interests of their own uh, that will implement policies, even policies that are aimed at benefiting the working class, they will implement them in ways that can only be carried out by members of their stratum and require the existing uh, institutional framework of the state to implement. It's it, it just, uh, by the nature of things, impossible for a popular majority to control the state from outside. Okay, so let's... Before, I know a lot of your book is really focused on the United States, on, on our state in particular, but if we could just use a more global example of what you're talking about, I recently was talking to Douglas Lane from Sublation Media, and you know, uh, we got on the topic of, of this, and um, Syriza the Greek party came up as an example of a failure uh, of the left to effectively implement changes. And I, so, you know, that's not how I understand the situation, meaning I don't really think that um, 
there is a, a possibility for a party like Syriza to make any changes uh, because of all these other structural limits. And, but that wasn't uh, Doug's takeaway. But anyway, um, are you familiar with, with uh, that situation? Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, in uh, the later chapters of the state, I actually put a fair amount of uh, pay a fair amount of attention to it, uh, where I argue for a a sort of dual track uh, strategy that doesn't doesn't in any way rule out electoralism, but uh, argues that electoralism should not be the primary emphasis. I mean, I, I think uh, it's possible for a party like Syriza to uh, make significant changes, but they will do so primarily in response to outside pressure. And when it comes to electoralism, the, the primary interest of social movements uh, on the outside that are engaged in mass agitation and building counter institutions and so on uh, should be on, you know, conditionally supporting uh, political parties like Syriza and saying, well, we'll, we'll endorse getting you in there uh, conditionally but we will not give you, uh, we will not alienate any authority to you or give you a blank check to do anything. And we will not forswear any of our own power to do things in the future with or without permission. And uh, once you're in there, we will continue to hound and, and pressure you to do what you said you were going to do. And we'll withdraw support if you don't do it. And we'll continue our work of building post-capitalist society here on the ground within the interstices of capitalism on our own without your permission. Uh, And, you know, in this strategy, the, uh, the, the role of the electoral party is not to carry out a construction effort on their own initiative. It's primarily to run interference from the people building the new society on the ground and to provide political cover, doing things like uh, negotiating with the European Central Bank. Uh, ideally, it should be a sort of a, you know, a good cop, bad cop situation where Syriza goes to Merkel and the ECB and says, uh, look, we'd like to cut a deal with you, but we've got these crazy people on the ground and and, and who knows what they're going to do uh, if they don't get their way. So you'd, you'd better cut us some slack and make us a really good deal because we can't answer for what those, those people might do. Uh, so let's apply that to the American situation because, um, in the Bernie Sanders campaigns are a perfect example, I think, of not that, <laughs> not that yeah. strategy. But a lot of people would think that it that is what that strategy looks like. And if you could talk about the difference between what you're proposing and what the DSA and Bernie Sanders and people like that have been trying to do, I think that would um, clarify for a lot of people, especially people who are absolute in their rejection of voting and things like that, uh, what the difference is? Well, I'm, I'm actually, you know, fairly uh, sympathetic to the strategy of, you know, of uh, primarying establishment Democrats and pressuring them, but then voting for the lesser evil in the, in the election, because I think, you know, most, most of the critiques of uh, lesser evilism have an unrealistic idea of what it's possible to achieve through electoral strategy. I think uh, we should go full guns in supporting insurgencies like 
Bernie Sanders or absent Sanders, at least uh, comparatively non-toxic, uh, more establishment candidates like uh, Elizabeth uh, Warren, uh, which which is not saying a whole lot, but uh, but then you know hold hold our nose and and vote for the least bad alternative in in November and then pressure them relentlessly uh, tear them apart without mercy uh, in public commentary and refuse to be bullied by uh, centrist types who say we're giving ammunition to the Republicans but, uh, as far as I'm concerned the you know the primary purpose of electoralism, in a two-party system like we've got in the United States is just to pick the least bad battlefield on which to fight. Um, and, and in the case of the of 2000, it was just to stave off the, the immediate threat of the fascist onslaught from Trump and buy time for shifting the culture and for demographic change. Uh, but, you know, the whole, the whole point of it is just to have the least bad background against which to act in the, the primary effort of building counter institutions. So there's, there's not a whole lot to hope for in most circ circumstances other than just keeping the fascists out so that we don't have uh, the parks police and CB, uh, CBP acting as a Gestapo and actively rounding up anarchists. So uh, I guess what I wanted to, the, the difference I, I assumed that you would, um, mention is that a lot there's a tendency for people to put all their eggs in the electoral basket exactly and uh that's not what you're proposing at all no i, I mean uh, what happened in greek was that in greece was that uh, syntagma had a you know a huge mass movement they were incredibly prolific and in creating an entire ecology of counter institutions. And they gave support to uh, the Syriza movement. And then once it was elected, they just let it suck all of their energy and uh, essentially shut down and said, well, now we've got, now we've got a friendly power in, in government and we'll just sit back and let it do its job. And, that's a really bad idea. Uh, you can see the same thing with a lot of the millennials who supported Obama in 2008. Uh, they were the same people who supported Bernie eight years later um, after they were disillusioned. But, you know, ideally, uh, you know, they were a huge, powerful grassroots movement that could have brought an enormous amount of of power to bear, uh, pressuring the Obama administration uh, on a scale probably that would have dwarfed the Tea Party if that whole support network for the Democratic Party in 2008 had been kept together as a functioning network. But instead, David Pluff uh, abandoned it, dismantled it. So I want to talk about unions a little bit, too. Before, But before I move on to that, do you think there's some... Okay, I'll tell you what I think. I think there's sort of a ignorance about how policy works that <laughs> causes a lot of this um, uh, argumentation about... <laughs> voting and whether or not to vote because you know when i look at the actual policies that bernie sanders will underwrite uh one of them specifically is you know to to create a bank that would 
um, invest in cooperatives or invest in employees that want to want to buy out a failed company and things like that. And to me, it seems pretty obvious that this is something that would be a huge benefit to exactly the sorts of solutions that you're talking about in homebrew industrial revolution and other places. Um, and I wanted to know what your thoughts are about just this sort of uh, lack of knowledge about how policymaking works, which, you know, I got a lot out of a lot of understanding out of reading your recent book. Uh, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm an anarchist, but uh, I see the transition as being a prolonged process that's uh, largely evolutionary and I have no objection at all to welcoming welcoming state policies that make the system less extractive whenever it's possible to get them through um, you know I, I said earlier that uh, in most cases you know the most we can uh, hope for is to uh, stave off outright fascism and create a better background for, for building a new society. But I think it's, it's at least plausible given demographic shift and sufficient outside pressure that a uh, Bernie Krat government, uh, you know, someday when millennials and uh, Zoomers are the primary voting demographic, you know, passing a bunch of things like a guaranteed income or uh, a, uh, yeah, you know, uh, either a basic income or a guaranteed minimum income uh, implemented through a negative income tax, uh, drastic copyright reform, uh, and, uh, you know, a reformed financial system and, and and policies to increase worker control in industry, like a cooperative bank that you mentioned, or, uh, you know, something like the German co-determination systems, you know, single uh, card check union is a uh, union uh, organization and, and, and things like that and that would be a much better background environment against which to carry on the work of building a post-capitalist society you know it's something i think that ideally would uh, wither away when it became obsolete and most of the things that guaranteed were mood points but it would be hugely helpful to live in a society in a in a social democracy rather than reagan thatcher style capitalism during the transition process and i i consider if anything uh, social democracy to be a lot more libertarian than reaganite capitalism uh in its overall level of extract, extraction and oppressiveness. So, um, one of the last, well, I don't know about one of the last, one of the people who were anarchists that wound up coming out and saying, look, we need to have some sort of interaction with, uh, the electoral system with politics was Murray Bookchin. And he got a lot of shit for that. And um, in your book, you I don't know if you mentioned him or not, but you uh, mention this idea of accelerationism and as mm. sort of the ideological uh, background for why someone would think that voting is a bad idea from an anarchist perspective. Yeah. And I've seen the same thing, uh, not only from anti-electoralist uh, anarchists, but from people on the, on the left who reject any kind of uh, lesser evilism and uh, 
just advocating advocated voting third party or uh, sitting out the election altogether because uh, Bernie didn't get the nomination. And it all seems to me to be uh, based on an extremely flawed accelerationist logic uh, where they're assuming some kind of <laughs> implausible scenario where if, if you refuse to vote for either Biden or Trump, uh, and Trump wins, uh, you've got all of these intermediate steps that are all, you know, question marks, uh, based on, you know, some kind of Leninist, the worse, the better assumptions, uh, where at the end of the process, you get a revolution and, I think that's just really uh, extremely implausible and uh, unlikely. And from what I have read in the social sciences, I mean, it's a question that's been studied and the results are that uh, when people are immiserated, they're less likely to try to change things, not more likely. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> So just to uh, uh, finish up on this book, um, you spend a lot of time talking about the New Deal, the uh, Wagner Act, and some of these other things related directly to uh, labor and the, the impact that labor movements can have on the state. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that because we're seeing labor organizing. Uh, some some statistics show that it's declining, but one way or the other, it is shifting into different sectors. And I want to know what you think some of the expectations that are reasonable are for what we're seeing right now. Well, I think you know, this this year, uh, with you know the organizing in the service sector, might actually have seen the first net increase in unionized workers in years. I don't know, uh, you know, I haven't seen any any numbers, but it certainly seems like there's been a huge shift in in, in momentum. Uh, one thing I think is is at least plausible and that I'd certainly like to see is uh, organizers doing an end run end run around the the whole Wagner certification process and all of the the ways the procedural uh, system is stacked against them and just start to uh, acting as uncertified unions engaged in direct action on the, the job, things like the, uh, the open mouth and whistle blowing, uh, working to rule, um, uh, good work strikes and uh, various kinds of slowdown and sabotage or walkouts on the job, uh, engaging in public pressure campaigns with other community groups and things like that. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we've seen several threats of general strikes that seem to have had some effect back during Trump's government shutdown uh, over a, a budget impasse. Uh, the thing that really seemed to cause him to cave in fast was when uh, the head of the flight attendants union talked about doing a uh, general strike by airline staff if the if the impasse wasn't resolved. And uh, there was talk by some uh, AFL-CIO affiliates in New England, I think, after uh, or in the period immediately before the 2000 election, where uh, they were talking about uh, a nationwide general strike if 
if uh, Trump tried to illegally hold on power after losing the election. And that's the kind of thing that a relatively small number of workers uh, could do with a huge impact if it was just the most critical workers in key logistical nodes. Uh, we saw an indication of what logistical workers could do back in 2000, 2014 uh, during Israel's attack on Gaza, the BDS movement organized mass blockades of West Coast ports and caused uh, Israeli merchant ship companies to have to circle around offshores, offshore for several days or weeks. I, I forget, forget which. Uh, with the, the kind of global supply chains we've got now, just, you know, a small handful of logistical workers at key nodes can paralyze an entire economy. And if you combine that with other things like debt strikes and rent strikes, uh, it's quite plausible that uh, a fairly small number of people just bring an entire system down. Yeah, I see a lot of potential uh, in in the debt and rent strike strategy. Um, so I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I wanted to hear about Exodus uh, and also hear about what you're currently working on. I haven't read Exodus, so I'm not sure exactly what to ask you. But if you wanted to give us a, an overview of that, that'd be amazing. And um, yeah, and then we could talk about what you're working on now. Okay, well, Exodus... Uh really is, is something would be uh, a good read uh, along with um, the state because the two overlap quite a bit. Uh, the, the theme of, of Exodus is a, uh, a shift, is the sh historical shift in left-wing strategies from, for post-capitalist transition. Uh, the shift from the old left strategy of centralized hierarchical uh, mass organizations with the primary goal of seizing uh, direct control of, of the commanding heights of the state and large scale industry to uh, the new to new left and subsequent models that are more based on um, prefigurative or interstitial strategies and networked forms of organization. And in the second half of the book, uh, it's devoted mostly to case studies of practical examples of building the new society within the shell of the old, all the, all the different uh, examples of local building blocks, you know, things like community land trusts, alternative currencies, um, the new municipalist movements uh, in Spain, there were offshoots of M15 uh, groups like cooperation Jackson or the evergreen project in Cleveland and so on. <laughs> that's all stuff that's really up my alley. I'm definitely going to be reading that. Awesome. Um, what, so what are you working on now that, uh, and anything else you would like people to know about? Well, you probably, the most coherent explanation for it, if you go to my uh, Patreon site, patreon.com, slash Kevin Carson, all the, uh, all the posts are unlocked and I've got several posts where I, I discuss the initial conception of the project and subsequently uh, update the outline. But, uh, it's a, a very broad project on, uh, international security studies, uh, 
from an anarchist standpoint, uh, we touched on it a little bit earlier when we were discussing uh, the potential of, of uh, assassins, mace weapons, and area denial weaponry to uh, shift the advantage to the defensive. Uh, and I touched on it uh, to a considerable extent in, in desktop regulatory state and in, in covering networked resistance movements. Uh, so those, those are a couple of, of areas that I'm, I'm working on. Uh, I guess overall, uh, what I'm aiming at is uh, uh, considering the trends that are taking us, you know, first of all, towards the inability of superpowers to or major regional uh, powers to project their power against. Oh, let me rephrase. Uh, first, you know, first of all, things that are reducing the ability of the United States uh, as a superpower to project its power uh, against regional uh, powers like Russia or China, and second, secondly, the tendencies reducing the ability of major regional powers like Russia or China to project power against their smaller neighbors like uh, Ukraine and Taiwan. And finally, uh, uh, technological trends that will make uh, countries own internal territory less governable. And I'm also uh, developing, uh, uh, planning on uh, uh, chapters, a uh, chapter at the end on developments uh, in things like uh, the rent and debt strikes we discussed and uh, bringing uh, in uh, the work of a lot of thinkers like Michael Hudson and Steve Keen on the international finance system and its vulnerabilities it's the whole project it's still you know pretty vaguely outlined and i'm still mostly engaged in very broad uh background reading but the goal is a multi-faceted analysis of all different aspects of the of uh, the process by which the international state system and uh international corporate rule will uh, lose their ability to enforce power over the planet. That's really awesome. Um, that I've really wanted to read a lot more on those topics. You know, I uh, never know where to start, whether I'm, I should go and read class wits or, uh, or what, but um, all this, all these topics we've covered and you're writing on them, I think is incredibly valuable. There's not a lot of writers in the anarchist space that I, that I feel personally give these topics, the sort of research that they require for practical concrete answers, or even, uh, a coherent history to be told about different institutions and you're always uh seem to be ahead of the crowd on that oh thank thank you very much it's it's nice to hear because i i definitely have my share of uh, enemies out there who think uh, my work is not only worthless but uh, one guy said my latest book was probably soaked with pee uh if you if you <laughs> Get the uh, if if you go to the Amazon listing for uh, the state, I think you can look at an enlarged version of the last cover. And I decided to make all of the cover blurbs quotes from people who hate me. I got a really good laugh out of doing that. Is that like you got George Riemann and? Yeah, yeah, and a lot from Stefan Kinsella. <laughs> that's that's pretty funny. <laughs> well, fuck those guys. Uh, yeah. And thank you very much for coming on the show. If you want to hang out a bit afterwards, uh, 
and debrief. I'll be on the line, but I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. If there's anything you want to promote, I got your Patreon on the screen, but anything else, uh, now's your time. That's that's it. I mean, Patreon is my main source of writing income, and uh, anything I've ri- I've written, except uh, for for uh, the state, I haven't gotten uh, PDFs of that up yet. But just about anything I've written can be found in uh, PDF format, either at my academia.edu page or uh, kevinacarson.org. Uh, the the um, academia.edu would be the place to go for a lot of stuff like uh, the research papers I've done at C4SS. But the, the books are all listed at kevinacarson.org. Awesome. I'll have those in the show notes for sure. Great. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Well, thanks a lot for having me. Absolutely.